You're very welcome to World in Union, uh, Balls at Ease weekly rugby show with me, Mick McCarthy, alongside Morris Brosnan. Each week we do try to give you the outside perspective on Irish rugby and on the game itself. This week, delighted to say we've got a great guest. We're talking to Shane O'Leary in just a few minutes. Um, Shane is... Uh, Irish uh, f- former Munster man. I think he played for Young Munster. Uh, played for Connacht. You'll remember him. I think he played in the in the Pro uh, Twelve or Fourteen. Was it Twelve or Fourteen when Connacht won it? it was Still 12, Pro Twelve, wasn't yeah. it? The Pro Twelve final when they beat Leinster. Uh, that amazing year for Connacht. But he he will be uh, someone who's going to the World Cup in Japan next year, but not with Ireland, with Canada the place where his mother's from. So we're going to talk to him about what it's like playing for Canada, how he got involved there, and everything that goes along with uh, playing for a smaller country like Canada when you're from Ireland. So um, a great story there. Morris, um, we'll get to that in a minute, but um, quieter week, I think, than we've been, we've been used to in the previous three weeks of the show coming off the November internationals. But interesting nonetheless, like we had four Irish wins out of four in the Pro 14, 14, not 12. <laughs> and, um, you know, Connacht won in, in South Africa. Ulster got a good win at home to the Blues. Um, huge wins for Munster over Edinburgh and, and especially um, for Le- Leinster at the Dragons. 49 point win. Like, absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, like, like a, a second string Leinster. Yeah. Against, so, Dragons tied with seven Welsh internationals back in their panel. I mean, they. It's not going well there. They, no. they sacked their defence coach last month, which is kind of concerning. Yeah. Um, I think, obviously, from Bernard Jackman's perspective, like he, he missed the recruitment window last year. Not, then they brought in 15 players, and I suppose now it's about getting them integrated and also getting a new coaching panel. And then on top of that, he's now to become more hands-on because, yeah. as we just mentioned, his defence coach is gone. So it, it's that's a really challenging position right now. Yeah, that's real pressure because you get to the stage where no matter what's working against you, that's too big a defeat at yeah. home to, as you said, not not even close to Leinster's first team. And, you know, um, Leinster obviously have bigger fish to fry next weekend, but for the Dragons, that's bottom of the table and not looking good at all. And it's interesting we're talking about Jackman because um, later on you want to do something very interesting where we talk about the coaches, the Irish coaches, who we want to look out for in 2019. We're entering Joe Schmidt end game. We've got Andy Farrell coming up. We need that next successor, to, and next year is a very big year for that. And it's funny that on the same day we look at it, we see what happened to the Dragons at the weekend, where Bernard Jackman is one of the, the great hopes of Irish, co- Irish coaching going back the last five or six years. And somebody else then, also looking at the results from the weekend, um, the Leicester Tigers, one of the biggest clubs in the world under Irish international Jordan Murphy, beaten by 30 points to Bristol. Like really horrendous stuff there yeah. they're in big trouble i was looking at the premiership table like i mean they're they're in a dog fight of about six teams at the bottom there but their points difference minus 78 by far the worst in the whole premiership like and getting absolute hammerings th- that's the i suppose that was where you'd really kind of look especially at, at this game you'd be concerned like the so what happened in that game colin eastman got an early red card up to 20 minutes for a high tackle on madigan and it, it had a massive bearing on the game subsequently they had this record league defeat. But mm. I think even if you just look at uh, Gordon Murphy's quotes after the game, like he said, mate, no one is more embarrassed than I am. Absolutely appalling performance. We are devastated. I am devastated. It's one of those things where we probably won't sleep until next Friday. I've asked the boys not to do any media. It's it's kind of apparent that it's entering crisis mode. Yeah, that there's it, a serious issue there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, then you've got a, somebody like Pat Lamb who has brought the exact same template from Connacht to Bristol. Like I saw Paul Williams, the rugby journalist, talking about... Not the crime reporter. Not the crime reporter. <laughs> um, okay. Talking about, I think they had over 800 metres carried. So it's very all ball in hand and stuff. Like yeah. that's, a, that's an obscene level of stats. You would expect it to be about 500 or less. Yeah. So to see that kind of template being brought and you know, you've got uh, John Muldoon coached pack with Ali Down, who's also from Connacht as well. Like that really kind of emphasis coming through Bristol. Like the... What you mentioned there is, I think, is the real the dog fight. What English Premiership is is the real kind of takeaway. Like between Bath and six and Newcastle, who are in twelfth, there's four points. Four it's, points. It's yeah. unbelievable kind of dog it world. So you talk about Mo- Leinster and Munster playing kind of understring teams on Friday and Saturday mm. ahead of this week. They kind of don't have that luxury, and if they do, they just get beat. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, they absolutely and 
you know that is one of the things that that obviously ha- has been an issue for mm-hmm. French and English clubs going back years, and they've you know they've changed the entire structure of the European competition to try and fix it. But you know, I think the problem is that Leinster and Munster to to an extent, and there's there's a couple of other teams in the Pro 14 like that that just have too much strength and depth for you know it to matter how important the league is because they can just Leinster can go out with a close to third team and win by 40, 49 points like and and say, again just that that number is just incredible but yeah and I suppose if you were to look at that from a like you got two Irish coaches there both former teammates and Leo Cullen and Bernard Jackman kind of of a similar age profile and whatever about expectations of you know like we'd have a lot higher expectations for Lens than we do for Dragons, but you would expect Dragons to maximise their potential, which they aren't doing right now. I think yeah. that's would be it was admitted, and you would you would ha- you would expand in that level of standard or expectation across the board. Like that's yeah. where the Pro Fourteen needs to get. Yeah, I have to say, I was watching the game and you turn it on, kind of expecting Leinster to do that. You know, it's like you're used to that being something similar, you know, maybe not as extreme, but in a Leinster Dragons game, it's going to be something similar. But you turn it on and you see some of the Welsh faces there. As you said, they brought seven internationals back Mm -hmm. into the team. Very familiar faces to us against this kind of young Leinster team with some names that we're kind of possibly excited about, but don't know yet. And we're we're looking at them sort of seeing what they're all about. And you kind of change and you... You know, you change what you're thinking about, and you go, "Jesus, like this is a tough enough test. Like this is a this should be a dog at all club team that they're playing here." You know, th- these aren't you know complete rubes, and that's how they played. You know, Leinster again just ran over them, did whatever they wanted in in the in the whole game. You know, um, so look, that is an issue. It's it's an issue for Jackman. I think no matter no matter what is working against them as the Dragons, as very much the fourth team in Wales, and I think that it's not an easy position it's similar enough to being Connacht coach here I think you know that said you would like them to play at or above their level and I don't think they're doing that at the moment so that's a lot of trouble and Jordan Murphy definitely in, in a bit of trouble at Leicester because Leicester's too big a team to be being beaten by 30 points to, to, to a team like Bristol but just on Bristol you did mention um, him there in passing and how Pat Lamb's uh, teams are doing Ian Madigan absolutely tearing it up but out half for them yeah and it's I great to see it's unbelievably great to see because I think sometimes we kind of frame Irish players abroad in that what will they do for the Irish as a, as a country for Joe yeah. Smith's Ireland yeah. when they come back and so yeah. sometimes it's kind of nice to see I was sitting at home on Saturday evening just I flicked on Sky Sports and saw like Duncan Casey coming on after 50 minutes for Grenoble and Duncan Casey was fourth choice at Munster horrendous injury profile yeah. and is now kind of living it up in France and it's got whatever about like just from a sheer kind of rugby perspective not in a, it doesn't always have to be framed by Irish rugby just mm. to see these players go abroad and actually make something of it like have, yeah. the, have the stones to go and risk something I mean change their life around to yeah, try and like get you mentioned Madigan Madigan moved to a championship team Madigan, yeah. Ma- Madigan dropped down a division like Ma- he kind of bought into something and is now playing this incredible rugby under Pat Lamb, a lot of ball and hand stuff. He only missed, he was flawless off the tee. And he only missed one, which was, it was way out in the touchdown. I don't think mm, it was. In a huge anyway. win, like so yeah. lots of kicks, yeah. Um, so the, 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 there was something kind of encouraging just to see Irish play, Irish yeah. rugby players abroad and actually making something of it without it necessarily having to frame it as in what happens when they return. Yeah, it's so true because I just to change sports even for a minute, when I watch football, you know, you'll be always watching, like almost an obsession with watching English yeah. football through the, uh, like, how's Shane Long doing? Why is he not in the Southampton team? And, you know, and you're basically watching one person when you're watching the game, but it's all because of how they'll do, are they getting their Premier League minutes so they could go and play for Ireland? But it's funny when you see somebody like Glenn Whelan or Wes Houlihan or something, if you're watching games that aren't playing for Ireland anymore, you still find yourself in the set, you, you know, you have to remind yourself almost like, is this, I just want this guy to do well. Yeah, it's something exactly, to do with yeah. me or Ireland. I just like, you know, it's a, it's a Irish guy doing well over in England. It doesn't necessarily have to mean, and it's the exact same with rugby, it's the exact same with watching Zebo, I think, for Rassing or something. You just want him to do well. Yeah. And I think, and, and definitely with Madigan, I think a lot of Irish people will feel that about Madigan. He's somebody that you know became a star in the in in the world cup three years ago um and it didn't quite work out in leinster and people were kind of disappointed by it and then you know you go to the english championship as you said you disappear and ian madigan is borderline forgotten about so to see him go and tear it up against a big team like leicester a team that like you know a, a, a a game that's gonna make some waves and him to kind of be the star turn there. It's people will be delighted to see that, and I think we we'll, we'll keep an eye on how on how um, Ian gets on over the course of the year. But um, yeah, and I mean, I guess 
like when you look at a guy like Madigan, like Madigan, so he gets a massive hit and he picks himself up after 20 minutes and kind of tries like that. But this stuff is cyclical. Like ideally, if Madigan is in bed there, he ultimately becomes a coach and then he's an Irish coach abroad. And then that all of a sudden becomes beneficial for Irish rugby in itself as well. Yeah. Like, like this stuff is, there's a bigger picture beyond just <laughs> why, why can't we get Simon Zebo and Dunnick Ryan back into the Irish squad? Or yeah, there, there's, okay. There's, there's no, I, I definitely see where you're coming from. I definitely see where you're coming from. I think people will look at mid 20s in Madigan and say, though, know, it's a bit early to be thinking about coaching. And, of course, you know, there, yeah. there, there will be a slot open. Um, there will be a slot open in a couple of years. Johnny, Johnny will like to think that it'll be further down the line. I think he thinks he's Tom Brady, and he may well be. But in a couple of years, there will be a slot. And look, we don't know who's coming. And we know that Ross Byrne is there. We know that Joey yeah. Carberry is technically supposed to be coming back in a year and a half. And we know that Ian Madigan is always somebody they can look at. So, like, Leinster will be thinking about their succession plans in the same way as I think the IRFU will be yeah, for, exactly. for their coaches, you know. But, um, look, Ian Madigan, um, as I said, is somebody that um, we'll definitely keep an eye on. And it'll be interesting to see as he goes because somebody, regardless of his place in Irish rugby, I think is somebody that we want to do well and we'll be looking out for. Um, he won't be going to the World Cup, though, because no. Irish uh, coach, Irish Joe Schmidt, <laughs> the Irish coach, don't select uh, players who don't play outside Ireland. One Irishman who will be going to the World Cup, though, but not for Ireland, is, is Shane O'Leary, who is Nottingham's out half. And um, I'm delighted to say we're, we're going to talk to him now. Now, Shane, thanks so much for joining us. You'll be going to Japan as um, a member of the Canadian team. How did that come about? Um, so when I didn't make Irish 20s back in 2013, I think, um, I inquired about play, playing with the Canadian uh, 20s as my mum was born in New Brunswick um, in Canada. So I emailed uh, the coach at the time called Mike Shelley, who's an Englishman, and um, he brought me over and got stuck in. We went down to the World Trophy. We actually finished second to Italy that year. Um, which was pretty cool. Um, and then after that, I moved to Grenoble. Um, I, I signed an academy deal over there. So I was there for one season. Um, and then I came back to Connacht and I was there for three. So at my time, when my time in Connacht had finished, um, I was looking for a new club and I decided uh, I may as well try and crack on with the international scene as uh, the coach Mark Anscombe at the time was keen to get me over. So um, I went over then and played and 10 caps now and uh, loving every one of them. Yeah, it's it's a class story to be honest. And did you have um, your mother as I was born in New Brunswick? Was it a, a connection that were you over to Canada uh, much as a kid or anything like that? Um, yeah, so so uh, I didn't go to Canada till I was about twelve, I think. But then we went twice in three years. Um, there's seven of us at home, so five kids. So as you can imagine, that's a pretty expensive trip for my parents. <laughs> um, yeah, so we went over. I think my granny came with us then as well. Um, so we went over to meet my great grandfather who passed a few years ago, but he was ninety six at the time i think so he was of a good age so um our mom wanted us uh, wanted us to meet him uh, so we went over twice in three years to see him um and then obviously i've been back a, a handful of times in the last kind of uh, year and a half two years now uh for a couple of tours and stuff so yeah no it's been good um it's a pretty cool country i think yeah you can probably tell that by the amount of people that are moving there from yeah. ireland at the moment it's kind of like australia 2.0 for people moving looking to um yeah, looking to get work and uh, restart their lives, I suppose. Um, but yeah, no, it's pretty uh, cool country. They're quite similar to Irish people, and they're quite kind and uh, enjoy a few beers as well and stuff. So um, yeah, no, I've I've really enjoyed it since uh, since I've gone over. I have to say, it sounds great because there is like obviously an Irish tradition of the opposite happening of you know the diaspora kind of being brought back by sport and being able to do that. And I have to say, it's a, it's a nice thing that you get to kind of explore your Canadian side and your Canadian heritage through sport as well um, kind of working the opposite of what we're kind of used to over here uh, yeah no no it's definitely cool for sure and um, like there's plenty of boys that are uh, that are doing it as well um, like my first in two of my first four games I was playing against AJ McGinty who was uh, yeah. playing a temple in the States and um, the last time I played against the States I think they had four lads with Irish heritage playing um, so like it's funny out there sometimes you're listening to accents and it nearly feels like you're playing a club game at home as opposed to uh, playing an international match in Halifax in uh, Nova Scotia. So, um, yeah, no, no, it's definitely been good. It's been a great opportunity for me as well. I managed to, uh, last year I managed to get another contract with Ealing uh, off some of my performances in the summer tour. Um, and then obviously I'm in Nottingham this season. So, um, yeah, no, it definitely, it stands well. And I think um, sometimes uh, I get a bit of slagging, you know, about it maybe being a tier two, tier, uh, tier two nation, but um I think a lot of the clubs rate it quite highly and uh, that international exposure obviously brings some uh, huge experience into your club games when you're playing against uh, 
some awesome teams. Like last uh, November, we played against uh, the Maori All Blacks. Unfortunately, I missed it through injury. But then last summer, we played against Scotland. And uh, you're playing against all these guys who play every week in the Six Nations against Ireland and France and stuff. So, um, yeah, no, so it's been a, it's been a great experience. And uh, I'm really enjoying it. Shane, you must have been, um, speaking of exposure, you must have been delighted to see the game get some exposure back here in the Irish press with uh, talk about why the germany Canada game was one of the most important, not the Ireland-New Zealand game. Uh, can you say that again? You must have been happy to see the exposure your World Cup qualifier got in uh, in some parts oh, yeah. of the Irish press. Um, yeah, yeah, it was funny, all right. Um, I saw it the morning and then uh, my, Twitter, my Twitter was exploding. People uh, <laughs> on the left, right and centre on it. Um, I had to agree with him. I did think it was the most important game. Uh, course, yeah. you know, we did manage to qualify for the World Cup, which is pretty cool. Um, but obviously there was another massive game on that, that evening and uh, we all watched it back in the hotel after and it was... Uh, I think it was a pretty special night in uh, Irish sport and obviously Ireland pulled out a, a phenomenal uh, result. I think it was the first time since 1995 that a Northern Hemisphere team hadn't conceded a try against the All Blacks or I think I read a stat like that somewhere which is uh, it's pretty phenomenal. Uh, but yeah, no, it was, it was an awesome game. I really enjoyed it. And like when you look, we've got this obsession kind of in Irish rugby with the school system and that kind of producing players but you'd be more so a product of the AAL system. Like, Would you have said that kind of is standing to you now? Um, yeah, so I remember when I was, uh, I think I must have been 16 or something, and I had a couple of rugby schools looking for me to come in, but it just didn't suit with the curriculum. Uh, okay. Kind of going from my leaving cert, and I'd done half the course uh, with my school, and they'd already done the other side of it, so I was moving in. I wouldn't have been leaving school for a few more years, I'd say. Um, so I decided to stay in St. Anne's Community College, so played club the whole way up, played Munster Youth, Munster 19s, 20s, um, and then obviously head away with Canada. But uh, yeah, I would have played a couple of years AIL with the Cookies, um, and then I would have made a couple of appearances for Weegians and Bucks as well as I was moving uh, around the Connacht clubs when I was trying to, you know, um, I suppose play more locally um, for the province that I was at. Um, but yeah, no, I, I rate the AIL quite highly. I think it's great, um, like the rugby scene pods of, uh, uh, or the club scene pods, sorry, um, that's been going on. It's kind of building that exposure for it. Um, I think it's got a good reaction. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely rate it quite highly. There's a lot of lads in the league that are would be more than well able to step up to uh, pro- professional rugby, I think. And you see it every year. There's always a couple of boys that uh, make that step up, like Neely Cronin and that last year. Um, it's, been, it's been really impressive. So I definitely rate the league very highly, yeah. Going to Grenoble then, um, as a, you know, um, under 20, was it just an, an interesting um, decision by yourself as well? I think it takes, a, it, it, it takes a bit of guts to kind of go and try and pursue a career in France like that. But um, there was a kind of an interesting Irish connection at Grenoble at the time. Um, it was an interesting place to spend a couple of years, I'd say, was it? Yeah, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was awesome. So I was actually only there for one season. But when I got back from Canada, 20s, um, I just headed back into the Cookies and started playing with them again. Um, and uh, I didn't get any uh, academy contract um, at home. So um, kind of, I was always going to play professional rugby in my own head. So it didn't matter where I, where I, had, where I had to go. Um, so yeah, so uh, Mike Prendergast uh, ended up signing for Grenoble, and Bernard Jackman were, was there as well, um, along with uh, Andrew Farley, who would have uh, played with Ireland in Captain's Connacht, um, mm. uh, and James Hart was there as well, who's obviously with Munster now. Um, so yeah, when I when I managed to get out there, um, it was very tough at the start. Kind of, it was my first time living away from home. I think I was 19, and uh, kind of all of a sudden I can't speak to anyone. Um, my two best friends were a, a Tongan fella and a Polish fella, and uh, they were only learning English, so I was teaching them English and then trying to learn French and trying to teach them French as well, uh, which I did in school, but uh, yeah, probably didn't listen too well in school. I didn't think I'd have to use it. Um, but yeah, no, the year over there, then after three months, you start being able to understand a bit more, and after six months, um, I was able to speak a little bit, and then kind of when I came home after 11 months, I was able to go to the bank on my own and um, kind of do kind of like those little tasks that you take for granted back here, but when you, when you can do it in a different language, it's... Uh, it feels like a bit more of an achievement. Um, yeah. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I played mostly in the centre when I was out there. It was quite hard to play at 10 when you're trying to learn to speak the language, never mind um, trying to tell people what to do and drive a team around the field. Um, but yeah, no, it was a great year. I really enjoyed it. I think it's uh, it helped me grow a lot as a person off the field as well. Kind of Like I said, my first time living away from home and kind of getting that bit of independence and then um, obviously it being quite difficult with the language barrier, but then uh, feeling like I'm, I was a stronger person when I got home and then... Uh, Obviously, got to play with Connor for three years, and we had some pretty, uh, pretty big moments in those three years as well. So that was all great. Um, great, yeah, no, it was brilliant. And when you did come to Connacht, actually, you just happened to be at a 
pretty remarkable time in their history. I know we were myself and Morris were talking earlier about the uh, the Pro 12 final in 2016 that you played a part in um, over in Scotland. Um, that's just a remarkable time to be swept up and to to, to be a part of the the Connacht squad that year. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was pretty surreal. So um, I didn't I didn't get too many minutes at the start of the year, but then there was a couple of injuries, and I managed to get I think it was five starts in a row. Um, mm. kind of held my own pretty well, did well, and then um, the boys came back from injury, and I managed to hold on to a place in the bench. Uh, with my USA counterpart, AJ McGinty, he was the starting ten in the final and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just it was like a surreal year. Um, it just almost felt like we couldn't lose the times, like you know, no matter what, we were kind of grinding out results and. Uh, like obviously there's some huge performances from some of the standout players and stuff. But I think uh, a lot of boys in the squad obviously put in quite a shift. And then yeah, I was lucky enough to be involved in uh, the semi-final and the final uh, against Glasgow and Leinster, which is uh, probably it's up there with one of the highlights of my career. Um, today I got my cameo four minutes on the wing, I think in that game. But uh, I would have got I would have played a fucking tight head if he wanted me to come on and play. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty special day, and uh, I just remember kind of one of the high, big, biggest parts of the day for me was when we got when we arrived at the ground and the fields of Atenry were ringing around the, the stadium, and we're walking into the bus, and then I, I didn't even know there was that many Connacht supporters in the world, uh, but there, it felt like there was a hundred thousand of them there, like it was absolutely incredible. Um, so yeah, they, they, we Connacht have a great fan base, I think, and sports ground is always lifting yeah. uh, off the, the roof, off the clan stand and stuff. So that day was that I remember that day for yeah for the rest of my yeah. life for sure. It's it's funny because I remember I was at the uh, the sports ground when the the seven six game against Leinster and there just felt like there was such a kind of a, this was Connacht's year mentality but you know to grind out or somehow win but when the final came around you actually just went out and beat them it was like a you just beat it wasn't luck or it wasn't faith or anything like that you just hammered them in the game of rugby it was just this brilliant performance it was like I don't know I I wonder did you guys just have this sense of this is our time we're going to take the, this opportunity with both hands. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Like, obviously, we played a very, uh, we played a very attacking style game where we were pretty much running from everywhere. Almost probably looked at times like we had a no kick policy. Um, but yeah, I think um, like the boys were pretty confident. I think we beat we beat Glasgow back to back, and if you if you're beating Glasgow back to back, you must be doing something right. They're obviously a brilliant team as well. Um, but yeah, there's just that sense of confidence and kind of uh, like we had no fear. I think um, which was which it kind of showed in the game. I think we were 20 points up at one stage or close to that. Um, and yeah, there were some huge performances from some of the lads. So yeah, it was pretty impressive. Talk to us a. L- oh, go on. Sorry, no, I was just going to say, talk to us a little bit about kind of Canadian rugby that you've obviously been involved there in one way or another now for going back kind of five six years, and obviously started playing um, with the international team last year. Um, what's rugby like in Canada? If that's not too kind of. Uh, wide ranging and basic a question is it a growing sport is it on the radar in uh, you know on national media is it something that is severely underfunded you know all those kind of things is it um is is rugby on the radar at all in Canada um yeah no no it's definitely an up and coming sport and I think um the more people we meet out and about now when we're out there and we uh, we try and get out in the community a bit and do a bit of coaching and stuff like that um when we're out there as well, um, uh, but it's definitely growing. Um, I meet more and more people that know rugby now, and more people know the rules. And um, I think uh, the the playing base is getting better and better. We've obviously gone through a bit of a transitional period where we've struggled for to get a couple of wins, but I think we've won um, our last four Test matches now. Um, obviously qualified for the World Cup uh, two weeks ago. Um, yeah, no, so I definitely think it's it's definitely up and coming, um, and it's growing it all the time. There's more kids playing all the time, and I think. Um, the players are getting better uh, all the time, especially with the MLR uh, having started now and uh, the Toronto Arrows having have a new team in. So, uh, yeah, we're definitely we're getting better and better all the time. And I think um, the sport's definitely growing. It's definitely up and coming. Uh, and also, I, can't, I suppose, kind of the background to rugby where it's very inclusive. I think uh, the Canadians really like that as well, um, which uh, kind of makes it an easy sport to pick up, you know, especially in uh, all, they all like a bit of... Uh, aggression and uh, from sports like that over in uh, North America with the likes of American football and uh, Canadian football and ice hockey and stuff. So I definitely think um, it's a sport that the public are like and our last three games were all televised on uh, TSN as well. So, um, yeah, no, it's definitely up and coming. It's definitely growing and I think uh, it's just going to get go from strength to strength now and get better and better out there. Shane, you mentioned the this kind of culture that you played in at Connacht and I'm kind of curious, like, was there any learnings from that 
underdog success that you could take forward with Canada? Uh, yeah, I think um, one of the biggest ones is uh, just kind of you got to back yourself. Even when you're not playing well, sometimes your confidence can uh, can carry you through, um, which would be a big thing for me. I kind of, if I missed a couple of kicks in a row or if I'm not playing particularly well, I kind of try and think back to, well, I know I can do it. I've done it all week in training and I've done it before in games. Like it's water off the duck's back kind of thing. Like, you know, you just kind of got to drop it and get on with it. Um, uh, it's kind of just believing in believing in yourself, kind of like um, in that pers- in that respect. Uh, just having, yeah, mostly the biggest one for me is just having confidence, just backing yourself, uh, not shying away from it, wanting to step up and trying to deliver for the team you're currently playing with. You mentioned uh, Morris talking about underdog mentality. I think when the World Cup does come around next year, um, I suppose when you're a team like Candy, you want to play the best teams you can possibly play, but. Um, God, you got a bit of a dog of a group, <laughs> New Zealand and South Africa, uh, just for starters. Um, I don't know, though. It must be exciting to to have that kind of to staring that down the barrel for next year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's it's a pretty difficult group. Um, uh, but these are this is what you play for. Like you want to play against the best players in the world. I want to hopefully start at ten and line up against Bowden Barrett. That's what I want to do. Like I want Sonny Bill to run at me a couple of times and. <laughs> target your channel it's, it's what you play for and as a kid i always would have dreamt about going to world cup and maybe i've taken a bit of a an alternative route but uh hopefully i will be on the plane um when it travels and uh um I'm, I'm absolutely just looking forward to it i can't wait to get out there and hopefully give it a bash yeah i oh, know we, we can't wait for it either it's gonna it's gonna be um it, it's gonna be some experience as you said um uh take it on new zealand south africa all that i suppose you the, the realistic aim, though, will be to target the Namibia game as the one to win and then experience the rest of them. I, uh, without, without kind of dismissing chances, I'm saying that that's, that will be a success of a World Cup if you can go and, and, and give Namibia a game and possibly sneak a win there. Yeah, well, obviously, I think we're going to, uh, with every team, you always go out and you aim to win every game. Um, obviously, some of the teams in our group are best teams in the world, but at the same time, uh, so has anything happened on any given day? Um, yeah. You said with my, with my uh, underdog mentality, I kind of won the Pro 12 um, uh, in the 2016 season and, or 2015 season, and we'd never uh, been to the semi final before, so it's all uncharted territory. Um, I think uh, a couple of the boys have played against uh, New Zealand before uh, in the last World Cup, but then again, or the one before it. But um, yeah, look, we're going to go out and we're going to try and uh, just look, make sure uh, we look after our performance, and then hopefully the results will come our way as well. Yeah, no, absolutely fair enough. Before before we let you go, um, Shane, you're uh, playing your club rugby in Nottingham at the moment, as as you mentioned. Um, How is that going for you? Is that um, is that something that you're kind of um, enjoying that level in England? Yeah, no, I'm absolutely. I, I'm I'm really enjoying my time in Nottingham. I think there's kind of a real family feel uh, to the club out here. I think uh, all the boys get on quite well and kind of look after each other. And then um, we're playing quite an expansive game as well. I think we're fourth in the league at the moment. Um, uh, we're tied for it with two other teams on a on points difference um, or whatever. But we we beat Ealing, uh, who I would have played with last year uh, in our last uh, league game a couple of weeks back. So that was obviously a bit of a special one for me. Um, and then uh, yeah, I just we're playing a good brand of rugby. We're throwing the ball around a lot. I'm having fun. Uh, we're doing well as a team. Uh, I'm think I'm playing quite well individually. So yeah, no, no, I'm definitely enjoying it. Uh, and it's a good club. Yeah. Well, listen, you'll be uh, Nottingham will be a team we'll be looking out for, and definitely come the World Cup and come all the all the games between now and the World Cup. Canada will be certainly a team we'll be looking out for, and we look forward to seeing you uh, wearing the number ten jersey again. Thanks so much for joining us today, Shane. No problem, lads. Thanks for having me. Great stuff there, Shane. Um, yeah, that's a great story, isn't it? Definitely, really, yeah. I'll be something I'll be watching for um over the next few months anyway it's a perfect caveat to what we were talking about earlier which was the idea of an Irish guy going and forging his way without and outside this context of what happens with the national team just yeah. doing his own way and uh driving as it looks like yeah and like you know maybe if he injures uh an all black or two in the world cup uh, well, Ireland, you know yeah. or maybe a south <laughs> african before ireland might get past the quarter final with thanks to <laughs> another irish man so you never know but um definitely something we'll keep an eye on as the year goes on uh shane o'leary 
his, uh, his name again if you want to look him up and find out a little bit more about him. Now, Morris, uh, we'll look ahead to the uh, the return of the Heineken Champions Cup next weekend by looking at the opponents for the Irish team and how they've been getting on in a couple of minutes. But as we did mention earlier, we did want to talk about some Irish coaches um, who you want to have a big 2019 because... We are now, we've got Andy Farrell, who's going to be replacing Joe Schmidt, but who's going to be replacing Andy Farrell? Who are the RFU going to bring in under Farrell? How's that next succession plan going? And uh, you wanted to talk about a few a few of the, the guys, both here and abroad, who uh, might have a say in that. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, I kind of think maybe last week, probably fairly, Andy Farrell kind of got lost in the water because it was such a celebration of what Schmidt has done and kind of a bit of a mourning yeah. that he's going to move on. But it's just like it does... It is worth saying that Andy Farrell is a phenomenal appointment and he's come, is highly regarded. It's kind of interesting to see this idea that he's been shoehorned as just a defence coach mm. because of his rugby league background. But his first job at Saracens was actually as a skills coach. So he's got experience in that like in that regard in the past. He's he kinda I I it's funny just in researching for this, I found the questionnaire from the Independent in nineteen ninety nine and he spoke about Bill Landerman who he said had the biggest influence on his career, who's a fitness coach, like totally away from that. In the same interview, he also got a phone call mid thing from an eight year old on file telling him that he wanted to start playing rugby. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the but in terms of the succession plan, the, so you know, something has to happen beyond Farrell replacing Schmidt because we're also going to lose Greg Feek, who's currently double jamming at Japan, and after World Cup, he moves to Japan full time. That means you need a scrum coach, you also yeah. need a coach to take over the backs coach it's not it doesn't have to be a like for like replacement i think we had this there was a presumption in a lot of places that it was just going to be short lancaster would become yeah Farrell's de facto number two we don't know if that's and even if it is leinster need to will need to bring someone yeah. in and it's all part of the same tent really you know and and it's speculation about a guy who's traveling over we just we're going to speak about bath later bath need a head coach that's a lot closer to the home for yeah. lancaster than dublin or Leinster or Ireland are you know th- th- there's a whole host of things that could happen in the next 12 months that would mean that the this Lancaster idea might not pan out the way it is it's, just, it's I mean this is all speculation so I guess what we're going to talk about today are Irish coaches who can actually help I suppose what we're talking about is the you know we it's really really hard for the IRFU to develop coaches in the same way as develop players because it's you lose them from your catchment area very, very easily. So you got a guy like Paul O'Connell who they tried to streamline from mm. Munster to the Ireland under twenties, but then suddenly he deviates and he's going to South Francais. Now he'll build up a CV there and hopefully come back and use that in yeah. Ireland. But they c- that's outside of your control. You can't you can't necessarily, you know, plan for that or account for that. Yeah. So in that regard, I suppose we could start talking. Yeah, about you're looking. At, you're looking at kind of five guys. You're sort of dividing it up loosely enough on backs and forwards. Bearing in mind that all these guys are probably flexible mm-hmm. in how they're doing it. But the backs first. You're looking at Nigel Carlin. I think no surprise and Ron Nogara, who's on his way back down to New Zealand at the moment, and I'm not sure has is a is an urgent replacement at least. For yeah, in Irish rugby. So just on Nigel Carlin, by the way, like Nigel Carlin, I think uh, probably deserves a lot more credit or. It's certainly kind of. I think he's definitely in this discussion. The reason he's in that discussion is because he was over the Ireland twenties, that incredible Ireland twenties, which uh, developed Andrew Porter and Jordan Armour and James yeah. Ryan. He subsequently come back to Connacht where he started out. The Connacht like players that go to the land have spoken really highly of him in terms of his eating with them. But he's a backs coach, and you can see when you see Connacht against the Shields at the weekend, and this really clever move off a line out where you've got Tom Farrell who's been in sensational form for them, hitting up as first receiver and ends up scoring a try from you know 50 meters that's planned like that's a coordinated move there's a coach behind the scenes who's drilling that in and yeah. so the the evidence is quite strong for a guy like Nigel Carlin who I mean who's got a really good age profile for this role there's I mean for anyone who read the Sunday papers yesterday I know like, like Peter Riley was suggesting in the Sunday Times that it needs to be what Ireland need to do next is appoint a, an experienced head I, I mean I don't necessarily agree with that I think I think you look at a coaching setup like South Africa's and they've got Jack Ninebar and Alan Waters and Razi Erasmus and all guys kind of young in their 40s encouraging coaches. I don't think the age profile is actually that relevant to be honest. I think it's the uh, it's the figure itself. I don't think you need the yeah like um a guy to to you know oversee or like these yeah it depends on the personality precisely yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and so I think that's so I think I that's a fair point. And in I this think regard that we don't need 
somebody older yeah. necessarily. Uh, Ron Agara has spoken quite openly about the idea that he would be uh, open to discussing this role with Irish Ruby. I think he'd be a phenomenal yeah. tip. Certainly eventually, anyway. Yeah, yeah. down the line. I mean, uh, I think the it should be a kind of priority to get the likes of O'Gara and O'Connell back into an Irish setup. Not because they're monster legends or not because of what they've done yeah. as players, but because of the renowned experience. Like They're building up incredible CVs, and if we're not betting from that, somebody else will. Yeah, now actually this is interesting because we can put O'Connell in here as well because <coughs> obviously he's in one of your five in, in the forwards bracket and he's mm -hmm. in Sad and Rogers at Crusaders. And there's a part of me that disagrees with you here in that I think... It, Ronan O'Gara, Paul O'Connell are always going to have a magnet bringing them back to sure. Ireland at some stage in their life. They're both, not only are they obviously family here, they're from here, everything like that, but they're also like giants of the game here and, they're, and they have contributed so much as players to Irish rugby that I think if they have something to contribute as coaches that they will want to naturally bring that expertise to Ireland as well. In the meantime, I think it's an amazing thing that they're going around. Yeah. Like, the fact that Ronan O'Gara is so heavily involved in the Super Rugby Champions is, I think, one of the most phenomenal and under-talked about things that's happened in Irish sport. That this like this guy who was such a legend of a player went and got these um, reps under his belt at Racing. That was cool enough on its own. But then to go and say, do you know what, I'm going outside of Europe and I'm going to go and do this in New Zealand. And to be basically second in command of a team that won Super Rugby at this stage of his coaching career is absolutely amazing. And there's hardly anybody, in. and the reason we keep getting Southern Hemisphere coaches is because European coaches don't know how, that don't travel the way Southern Hemisphere coaches do. Yeah. And don't know that, you know, and don't know the games at all levels and don't have experience in New Zealand, in Australia, in France, in England, in Ireland. And Roger's setting out in that path and I think it's going to benefit him so much. And I, I do kind of, I, I get what you're saying about um, his experience being wasted if it's not eventually going to come back to Ireland. F again, from the IRFU's, going back to our conversation earlier, like that's, you know, we're talking specifically from the IRFU's point of view here. But uh, I feel like that, that option is always going to be there in the future. Yeah. Maybe not right now, but um, in the meantime, God, like, I mean, he could, this guy could be a head coach in New Zealand. Yeah, very I, soon. And I, like I, I, I would kind of love to see that happen, to be honest. But I also think that from Andy Farris' perspective, from an IRFG perspective, you should try and create the best coaching ticket you can. And if uh, if Ron McGarry is interested in being a part of that, or if the you've but got those, do you not think that the best coaching ticket available might include Raj now, but could in five years' time, when he's still a young man, be? a much better coaching ticket because of the experience he'll gain in the meantime so that the IRFU should look at a very long term op option in that we have Andy Farrell we have him for however long we have him he's on the back of Joe Schmidt expertise he's worked with Joe Schmidt we're going to get a solid number two of which there are good options there and with succession plan and we leave Raj to do his thing, to find his experience. We leave O'Connell to go and do the same thing. And eventually, these guys, if they're good enough, if they're what we think they're going to be, are going to come back with the ideas, with the whole world at their feet, knowing yeah. rugby in all over the world, inside out, and come back and be the best possible Irish coaches they I, can be. I think the, from an Irish perspective, like I totally understand what you're saying, but I think from an Irish perspective, your, your priority is to have Ireland as strong as they are for as long as they can be and if that means that you've got a guy like uh, O'Gara who comes in and deputises with Farrell with the view of a long term succession plan of him ultimately becoming the Irish coach I think that's just as uh, strong a position to be in as yeah. it would be to have this guy developing in his roster and his, you know, his array of skills abroad yeah. as well No I get you I suppose my point I think is that we have another level of good coaches that we can get to before them. Yeah. And that they will do, and at, at the moment, what I would say is, and again, this is guessing, and it's really hard to project how somebody will do in a job, but judging by what I know at the moment, that they would do an equally good job right now, but mm -hmm. in five years, maybe could be with better, more yeah. experience, O'Gara and O'Connell could do an even better job. Yeah, So sure. whereas right now... They'll, it's 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 much of a muchness who we appoint. Yeah. So we could bring in whoever it is, and there's other names on your list, interesting ones. You know, you're talking um, John Fogarty, Dan McFarland in, in Ulster. You know, and there's there's plenty more besides as well. And that's the other thing. You know, like we haven't talked about Leo Cullen in this discussion. Yeah. 
um, he's a Heineken Cup winning coach. Who, you yeah, know? yeah, and I, I suppose that's the problem with from a Leicester perspective is that if you lose somebody like Lancaster, you, you, it's a really, it's an unbelievably interesting kind of um, relationship there, where you've got a guy who, for all intents and purposes, is overseas on field training and overseas moves and drills, but isn't the head coach. He's yeah for in position anyway. He's not. It, that's Leo Cullen's role, and to replicate that might be difficult if you're. Uh, Sp- Lancaster has spoken quite openly about the idea that he doesn't really want to be a head coach, but that's yeah. not that's not that's a quite a a, u- a unique position. I also I mean I would be kind of hesitant about um, but if somebody like O'Gara was open to the idea of coming home about kind of casting him off, like I'm sure uh, New Zealand would have got Schmidt home a lot earlier yeah. if possible. And I'm, I, I, I you can build a life somewhere else as well, and yeah. I, I I totally see what you're saying there, and 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 it's not like it's. A guarantee. It's just something that I would be confident about. And also, I don't. Again, if there was a if there was a real come and get me, yeah, I yeah. would say absolutely, let's do it. But what I'm saying is, if these guys, and again, I'm putting O'Connell into that bracket as well. Mm-hmm. If these, and I'm hearing an interview with O'Connell recently, and the way he's kind of adapting to French life, I think he's a hundred percent all in as yeah. only Paul O'Connell can be to this role at the moment. That would never think about anything else, at least for the time being. But these guys, um. Unle- if they're happy where they are, yeah. I'm saying let them off. I'm I, not saying. I know you I'm not saying you, yeah. reject them in any sure, way. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking about the forest coaches, we t- you just touched on John Fogarty. I think we need a scrums coach, and John Fogarty is probably a standard option. He's worked mm. with all these the Leinster props before. He Mike Ross has spoken quite well about. Um, we understand like that. Fogarty had Ross in earlier this year coaching Leinster Academy props. Kind of in the two, like he's got a really good, broad range of his remit. Um, I know Greg Feek has dealt with Fogarty in the past as well. Like, I, I think, f- in terms of a scrum coach, I think Fogarty is a standout option. Yeah, the good show. Evidence that is with Leinster. And so important. Like we should always remember that John Hayes, a legend of Irish rugby and Munster rugby, and, and in no way critical of him, but from John Hayes to Mike Ross. And you're talking about it in like a nearly a 12 year period where we had one guy in that position, the most technical specialist position on a rugby field. Our scrum was poor. We had nobody to replace them. They weren't even like the best of the best. To go from that to where we are now, where we have probably fourth and fifth choices that are international standard. Yeah. Never mind the fact that we've got the best in the world in Tyke Furlong and somebody who could even challenge him for his position in the yeah. near future in Andrew Porter, you know, um, as as a top two. We've got, like, lads underneath them, like Archer and Ryan and everything like that, who had, you know, Finley Bealham even, like, you know, who are good players. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing what's been done, and that work can never be let go. And I think the most important thing you mentioned there is what, you know, what Cullen has done, which is starting that process again, it's more important that Mike Ross or, you know, is working at a lower level than he is at a senior level at the yeah, moment. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I think that, like, the, to touch off that idea of the development of props, you can't give Greg Feek enough credit for that. Yeah. I mean, and this is, like, we've been told this openly by players that the uh, he, coaching heathers within provinces, the, even, you know, in terms of move the players and the delegation responsibility there, I think the, so that, when you talk with the remit of a scrums coach, it's not nine to five on a training pitch. It's the development of a position. It's, and not only that, but the development of young players coming through as well. And I think somebody like Fogarty has demonstrated the ability to do that. As yeah, we it, it looks like Fogarty is is the right guy. He yeah. can continue that. It's not it's not a clean break from from Feek's legacy, mm-hmm. I suppose. Yeah. So, um, is there anybody else there? McFarland just, is just the yeah, last just briefly on McFarland. Like, what we <sighs> getting somebody back into a the IFU umbrella? I mean, I, I'm sure that when Dan McFarland's who I suppose his video work in Connacht was absolutely amazing. Like the players have really raved about that. To lose him to Scotland to a f- and as a force which wasn't part of Irish rugby's plan. That wasn't yeah. that but thing. So to get him back in now with Ulster and have been kind of almost instant improvements. And mm. just in terms of Lesnar, I know they've got players into key positions and things like yeah. that, but in terms of good win at the like weekend. Yeah, and also just like areas of the game that they were really kind of lacking, like they're uh, this is Depending on personnel, obviously, but still a really s- much stronger set piece, a much stronger line out as well. Th- this that kind of overacting idea, th- it seems to be kind of positive signs from there. And I think he is a guy who has now latched up experience already, international experience as a forwards coach. Yeah, has worked with two different provinces now. I think he could be a real asset for Irish rugby in the ne- over. I'm not saying 
for Ulster finally got it right and now you take it all away from them but just down yeah. the line I think Dan McFarlane is uh, somebody that you'd watch his development closely yeah I think my last point on this is that someone like Mc McFarlane did come back when the right opportunity was there and him it might have been in the plan you're right but he yeah, did go and right. get that experience and I think there's always going to be an element that we only have four teams mm -hmm. there's only so many jobs that are there and eventually I think you know, there aren't going to be windows, there aren't going to yeah. be opportunities to open up for people and them going and spreading their wings and finding jobs elsewhere and us basically leading that uh, charge in European rugby, at least if nowhere else, is no bad thing for us, you know. And we did talk last week about, you know, is it possible that an Irish coach comes in after Farrell? And I think this is, is what a lot of this discussion yeah. is about because I think as, as happy as we are to have Farrell there is that problem that he comes after Joe Schmidt and there there will always be the calling of home. Yeah. No matter how well he does. And that's something that I would like to not be an issue <laughs> with the next person in the job, you know? Um, so that's a very interesting look. We'll, we'll keep an eye on all of those and how they're doing. And I think if other people sort of emerge as, as people to, to talk about over the course of this season... We will bring them up, and they're definitely out there. As well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by a guy like Noah McNamara, who has no playing pedigree really. He's just been developing as a coach, and there are a few have sent out to New Zealand for three months, and is now back looking over elite player development and things like that. Like, yeah. I think the that kind of planning is uh, Irish rugby is getting a lot right at the minute, and that kind of stuff will only be to the betterment eventually of the Irish senior team. Yeah, so it's a great time of year because we've just had the November internationals. We're all absolutely buzzing from things, but there's no real respite. It doesn't exactly it doesn't exactly stop now no. as we wait for the Six Nations because the the champions, the Heineken Champions Cup, is back this weekend after just one weekend of kind of league action as we build up to it. Um, Irish teams as we mentioned already four wins before really really good weekend you know we're kind of used to it at this stage but it, it, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be sneezed at either but the the three teams that that Ulster Leinster and Munster are playing in the in the Heineken Cup at the weekend not exactly in the best of form which yeah. people will be interested in if you start with um, Ulster who take on the Scarlets in Belfast on Friday night Scarlets well beaten by Glasgow, Glasgow yeah. at the weekend, which would have been a surprise. They're kind of knocking around, you know, to, with the divisions, it's hard to know, but they're about fifth, I think, in, in, in the Pro 14 at the moment in an overall sense. Um, they've been the strongest Welsh team for the last couple of years, obviously beaten to, to Leinster in the quarterfinal um, of this competition last year, but they kind of need to win in Belfast. This oh, they, I mean, it's, yeah. yeah, they don't win, they're gone. I mean, it's uh, one absolutely last chance to do. And they also brought a lot of these Welsh internationals back into their team last week. So you, Jonathan Davis is back, Pasha was back, uh, Wynne Jones is on the bench, Davis is back in the pack as well. So the, like the team is a full strength. It's kind of it's a real last chance to do. And I, to be honest, I would say that as well for Ulster after what happened in Paris yeah. in Racing. So if whichever team loses this, I think can can kiss European rugby goodbye effectively yeah. so, which is which is a which concern. makes the following week and more uh, the opposite fixture the, yeah. uh, you know easier for you know especially if the Scarlets are bringing Ulster back and to you know, Clinetley the, then if they've already won in Belfast they've probably killed Ulster at that stage that, like that's a really fascinating group as a whole you know like Racing are clearly despite you know they're they're doing only okay in France but there you're taking European rugby 100% seriously yeah. they, they played at the weekend and actually lost but they rested I mean, there was no Zebo, no Dunica Ryan, uh, no Finn Russell, no Vatorama, uh, Sarkozy, the hooker. I was going to say, you'll say a French name at some stage. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> also, also didn't play. So the rest is, I mean, the, the, you know, it was a very, a very, th and that, going back to what we were talking about earlier, by the way, that's, again, the point. They rested half the team and they ended up losing by, you know, by five mm. points, whereas Leinster can, Leinster don't have that, uh, Leinster have a luxury in that they yeah. don't have th that problem. Um, especially when they're playing the Dragons, I suppose. But, <laughs> Going on to actually just skipping Leinster for a minute and talking about um, Cast and, yeah. and Munster in Thoman Park. This is exactly, we were talking about this before we came on air. It's the same issue as what we're, like, if, if Cast are struggling, they lost to Agen. They're, I think, eighth? Seventh, in, I think. Seventh yeah, in, the, yeah. in the top 14. You know, they lose this weekend. They'll they're the going to throw in Europe because the most important thing for them is to get up the league in... in, in um, in France and this is why this is such a massive game for Munster because if they can win which you'd expect them to win at home and they go in and play a full strength cast side and, and put them away then you're almost getting a freebie the we following get, yeah. week in France and that puts you in such an amazing position in the group yeah especially and you know uh, th 
like cast have shown in the past just last year the tendency to focus on French honors and you know French champions losing to Agen isn't th- th- that's kind of a shock result and they try to they try to win ugly at the weekend you know they try I think maybe planning ahead for this week and it didn't work mm. and that kind of leaves you in them in a really kind of perilous situation where they know that French rugby all of a sudden is a really kind of looming priority and you can't like the the riches that you can't drop outside the top four in the top yeah. 14 you just can't, you can't let that happen so that all of a sudden becomes their priority and then you're talking about going to Tolman Park where their chances are low anyway I, w- yeah. I, I, I wonder I think there's a massive opportunity for Munster to make a big statement this weekend uh, in that game it was also great to see two teams well used to each other as well yeah played last season um, it was great to see speaking of Irish broads at the weekend for Ajen uh, Dave Ryan the Cork prop was tearing it up over there he's just right. seems to doing really well um, just an, another one of those like Duncan Casey for example who yeah. seems to have gone over and really taken to it and um, that seems to be going really well for him yeah Leinster then are um, travelling to the wreck for the scene of Bloodgate yeah. <laughs> yeah. nine bloody years ago, which makes me feel pretty old, I have to say. Uh, I don't think it'll be 6-5 this time, but Bat and their current form, yeah, a seven-all draw, <laughs> uh, seven draw with Sale at the weekend, and they only scored eight points in the in a defeat to Newcastle the previous game. They're not in the best of form no, either. And again, another team that welcomed back all the internationals and it didn't seem to bet in. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know what that's about. The interesting thing about this game is, for me anyway, is Skirvin Dempsey over Bat. And like the, you know, the, maybe the Lancaster narrative becomes a, a big deal in 12 months because all of a sudden Bath, is, you know, we don't know. They've released an open letter saying they will resign, you know, o- organize their coaching setup in the interim. And co- uh, players and fans don't need to be concerned about that. But yeah. what is a concern right now, for mo- as well as the Gervin Dempsey effect, and what does he know about Leinster that he might be able to use for Bath? Now, that, I mean, it's not necessarily a massively unusual situation. Yeah. But at the same time, it's still going to be interesting to see just how well prepped Bath are for some of this Leinster backline, some of their you know, set-piece moves and just how that kind of plays out at the weekend. Yeah, because the guy who had set them all up, anything that's left over is coaching on the opposite side. So that's always an interesting thing to look at. I do think professional teams are, especially teams as um, as advanced as Leinster yeah, are kind of well evolve, set up yeah. to, to handle that and, and to possibly even, you know, it's a bluff double bluff situation as well, you know, because you can look like you know he'd never expect you to play in a certain way and maybe you go and do that so yeah no it, it, it wouldn't be something that would worry me but would interest me but right. just for people's um uh, understanding sixth in the premiership very similar situation to to leicester actually really struggling there's a big it's bunch a, a in the premiership fight, as you yeah. mentioned between sixth and twelfth and and bath are there so they're nearer the bottom than the top in terms of points um as i said they drew seven all with Sale. They lost to Newcastle. They've lost to Newcastle twice in the last few weeks in their bottom of the league. Yeah. So, not in the greatest form. And I think if if Leinster can get a win here, you know, the Christmas party in the Aviva in a couple of weeks against them might even be, you know, might be a bit of a walk in yeah. the park. So it's funny that the three Irish teams this week, this week sets up the following week in yeah. all three. I think three wins this week. I think will turn into six wins. Yeah. Any defeats, you're go- I, I think you're going to find it very hard to turn around. I can see three doubles one way or another. And it's so often the case in, especially in European rugby, like this weekend when you're just coming to the midway, like that's the biggest hurdle of them all. I mean, and if you fall from it, you're, you're effectively gone. And if you yeah. clear it, you're in a really, really promising position. And all, like the all three provinces would be in a really promising position if they could get over the line this weekend. Yeah. Can't wait for it. It's got to be really good. Um, we will be back with you next Monday to talk about that and to talk about everything else and, and to go outside of Irish rugby as much as we can as we do here on World and Union. Um, as I said, we'll be back with you next Wednesday. Thanks very much to Morris. Thanks to Robbie for running things here so smoothly. And uh, we'll see you next Monday. Take it easy. <laughs>